So today we're going to start with chapter 4. It's about special distributions. So it's distributions that are very famous and very useful in engineering. So we're going to start with the uniform and the variable. We have already talked about it. Um, <clears throat> so now we're going to formalize their definition. All right, so this is the notation we're going to use for random variables. All right, so here that means x is distributed or has the distribution that is the uniform between a and b. So the like the pigtail right there uh, means has the distribution. And this is kind of a new symbol we're gonna has the following distribution, I guess, right? Following distribution. Let me just say CDF. Alright. So for the uniform, we're going to use the letter capital U, and the uniform distribution needs two parameters, A and B. All right. So for example, here we have, let's look at the PDFs. We have three examples. So for the blue one, right, A is uh, 1, and B would be 1.2 or so. Right. For the orange one, a is 1, B is 2, etc. So it's the limits of the distribution. <clears throat> All right, and that's the general formula for the PDF. So it's 1 over the length of the range of x, right? And it's 1 over that because you want these all these areas to, when you integrate it, it has to be equal to 1. All right. So that's why so between a and b has to be equal to one all right so if you integrate the pdf you obtain the cdf and it's going to be given by this formula now we have three brackets just you you make sure that when you're integrating so this is a for all of those so for any number less than a it has to be zero so you cannot use this formula. That's a very typical mistake. You just integrate between minus infinity and infinity. Um, so you might start at zero <clears throat> and integrate this equation when you should be integrating zero. And the same thing happens after b, right? When x is greater than b, it's just one, right? So that means we don't follow these lines up to infinity, right? It's just up to b in this case. All right, and then we have the expected value and variance. And these two, we simply compute with the formulas that we already know, right? So just a, a refresher, this is going to be the integral of x times f of x, right? And this one, we always use the shortcut formula, OK? So as an exercise, make sure you know for you, that you get these results, um, especially for the variance. All right, so the expected value is right in the middle of the range of x. So let's look at the green distribution, right? It goes from a is 1, b is 4, right? The center of gravity is right here, so it's in the middle. OK, so a plus b over 2. All right, so it's quite intuitive. <clears throat> okay, so that's all we're going to say about the uniform at this point. We're going to come back in the future. Make sure you know how to, again, uh, compute expected values and then the variance. All right. Okay, so the normal distribution. It's probably the mother of all distributions. By far the most important distribution, probability and statistics, because of the central limit theorem. Okay, which we're now going to introduce. <clears throat> the central limit theorem basically says that all linear combinations, and this is an example of just the sum of random variables, but it could be for any linear combination, they tend to the normal distribution, regardless of the distribution of the individual xi's. 
Okay. So if you recall the examples of uh, adding up the number on by throwing two or three dice, right? Remember, for two dice, we obtained the triangular distribution. So when you sum two dice, and then this is all chapter one stuff. Huh? If you add three dice, if you see the figures, uh, it's going to be not exactly normal, but pretty much it looks like a, a bell shape. Okay? So the more dice you add up, n dice, then it's going to look like a normal distribution, almost exactly. Okay? So whenever you add random variables, in this, the case of the dice is n random variables, each having the discrete uniform distribution between 1 and 6, right? Um, so that's why the normal distribution is so important, because whenever we perform the linear combination of random variables, right, in general, remember w before, it's, we have a coefficient ai times xi, right? So depending on this value, you can do sums, averages, uh, subtractions, etc. Um, so we use linear combinations all the time. And then what's striking is that regardless of the individual distribution of the xi's, it's going to tend to the normal distribution. Okay? So, um, and it, it appears all the time, again, in engineering. Right? Because many things you can express as the sum of other things. And whenever you have that, that's going to be normally distributed. All right, this is an example of showing you uh, the central limit theorem in action. So what we're having here is simply the average, which is the one of the most typical linear combinations you can make. So we're taking the average of all these random variables. Now, the xi's are going to have a distribution f of x here, which would uh, change by row, right? So. In the first row, we have the uniform distribution, right? So f of x is uniform between 0 and 1, as you can see, right? So here we're adding, if we add two distributions, so two such random variables, like adding two dice, right? And that's the triangular distribution. Right, it's, if you look at, it should be a perfect triangle. Like it. Now these are simulations, so it's not really perfect, perfect. Right, so, and then if you add five dice, then it looks a lot like the normal distribution, which is in, in blue there, right? So in the case of the uniform distribution, it only takes like three dice in this case, right? Uh, and you're going to get a good approximation by the normal distribution. <clears throat> okay, in this second row, the, the x size all have this distribution which is the exponential, right? It decays like that. You see that if you add only two of, of them, the normal approximation is not very good. If you add five, then it's a little better. And already by 10, it's a pretty good approximation, right? So it kind of depends on which distribution you're adding, how many you need to add in order to this be a good approximation. <clears throat> And finally, the last row, you can see kind of the same thing, right? So when xi has this distribution, um, it also takes around 10 to get a pretty good approximation. Okay, so that's the idea of the central limit theorem. Again, it's this idea of adding or doing linear combinations of individual random variables. And at the end, they, they all look the same. They all look normal after you do the the linear combinations. All right, so let's define this random variable, the normal random variable. So that, that's going to be our notation and mu comma sigma squared. All right, um, the normal random variable is also known as the Gaussian random variable by it, the person uh, Gauss, right, who invented it. <clears throat> All right. 
And then the parameters are two mu and sigma squared. The same mu and sigma squared we've been talking about says so the mean and variance of mu. All right, so let me jump here into the mean and variance right here. So for the normal distribution, you can apply the formulas, right? Again, uh, integral of x times f of x, right? That's going to give you mu. And the same thing for the variance, you're going to get sigma squared. So there's one distribution where the parameters are um, the mean and the variance. OK, this is the formula for the PDF of a normal distribution. Um, I don't like uh, to impose memorization of stuff, but this is one of the important formulas that we'll be using. So that's probably a good idea <clears throat> to have it in memory. OK, and then the CDF would be this guy. Just the integral, right? The integral from negative infinity to x by definition. And this is f of x. All right, now let's comment on the range of the random variable x. So I should have mentioned it. I should have put it here that it's really all the all the real numbers. So it's unbounded. It goes from negative infinity to infinity. OK, so and these are the PDFs. Some PDFs, examples. Um, here are the parameters. These are sigmas, by the way. And as you can see, all the mu's are equal to 0. So the mean, the mean is 0 but with different standard deviations. And this is the famous bell shape for three standard deviations of these values, OK? So it's symmetric with respect to mu, um, and it has this uh, characteristic bell shape. The CDF looks like this, so the integral of that right, uh, looks like an S shape. Again, it goes from 0 to 1, as all CDFs. Now, the problem with the, the CDF <clears throat> is that this integral does not have analytical solution. All right, so that doesn't mean that it doesn't converge. It does converge. It's just that we don't have a formula for it. You may argue that this is a formula, but we have an integral, right? So the integral is not easy to work with. Uh, what we want to do with integrals is solve them and obtain the result. But unfortunately, there's no uh, more compact form for this guy. So what people do is tabulate it. So we're going to do these integrals. Well, we're not going to do it, but people have done this, these integrals numerically. And then we'll have to look on tables to give us the answers. Of course, you can use your scientific calculators or computers to, to get these numbers. But there's not a closed form uh, formula that you can just uh, plug in values. <clears throat> All right. These are examples of uh, different distributions with different means and variances. Um, nothing too surprising here. The parameter mu gives an idea of the location where this mountain is located, right? It's the mean. And then parameter sigma and the standard deviation is also called a scale parameter. Um, because it determines how far it reaches, right? So it's like the range of, of x. All right, so that was the normal distribution, plain and simple. There's one very important uh, special case, and it's the standard normal distribution. The standard normal is simply z has a um, standard normal distribution, so it's normal, but it 0 and 1, right? So when mu and is 0 and sigma squared is 1, we call that the standard normal distribution. Now, the reason it's so important is because <clears throat> the tables that we're going to look up, the probabilities that I mentioned a minute ago, are only in terms of the standard normal distribution because it turns out that any normal distribution with mu and sigma can be transformed into a standard normal distribution.
and we're going to do that all the time actually so any problem regardless normal distribution with mu and sigma parameters we're going to transform it to a standard normal random variable okay so that's the definition when mu is zero sigma square is one so the pdf simplifies and now the cdf has a special name as denoted phi all right and it's simply um it's just a cdf right so we could also call it f of z of little z right but it's so important that people call it phi the function phi and that's the one that is tabulated right because again this integral does not have an analytical solution so we use normal probability tables which we're going to learn how to use um, in a few minutes I guess all right so let's go through some important facts about the normal dis distribution first one is that linear combinations are still normal random variables so we start with a very simple linear combination <clears throat> okay so we start with x being normally distributed and then the random variable y is a linear combination of x just ax plus b a and b are constants all right and it turns out that it's going to have the same distribution so normal that's what i mean by same normal distribution with these new values so the mean um, is going to be ax plus b yeah here i need a plus b so this is right that the parameters is this one and this one so this one goes here and then i miss the b there and this one goes there all right which is simply if you think about it, it's simply the expected value of y and the variance of y, All right? And those are always the parameters of a normal distribution, is the expected value of the variable and the variance, right? So what I'm saying is this is the expected value of y and this is the variance of y, right? So that's it. Now, you please go through the proof. It's... Um, it's very useful to to know this uh, and this is the, one of the main facts of normal random variables right so linear combinations of normal random variables are also normally distributed all right and this is the transformation that we use um, people call it z-scores so let's call it z-scores <laughs> And it's very similar to the one to the previous fact. It's a special case of the previous fact, right? Because x is normally distributed as before. And then this is right, one over sigma times x minus mu divided by sigma, right? So it's in the same form, ax plus b, essentially. Right? <clears throat> and if you compute the mean invariance of z, you will see that it's zero, right? That's the expected value of z. Or just as, uh, apply the expected value here and, and there, right? You get that. And then expected value of x is mu, so that's going to be zero. And the same for the variance. If you do the variance of that, you're going to get that it's one, right? And this is actually then the transformation we're going to use all the time. So typically a problem would start with x is normally distributed with mu and sigma squared, but the first thing we're going to do is this define z, the z-score, because then you're able to look up the probabilities in the phi table. That's the main reason. Um, now, if you have calculators, yes, I agree with you. It's not necessary, right? But it's good to know uh, the standard method people do it. All right, so that's this z-score. Let's talk about quantiles. <clears throat> so the quantiles are related by the same formula. So if you see, if you compare these two, they're the same formula, right? 
because if you solve for x in that formula, obviously you're going to obtain the same thing. You're going to equals that plus z times sigma. Right? So if that applies to any x and any z, it has to apply also for the quantiles. All right? So typically, the question will be posed, what is the quantile of x? Like, what is the median of x, for example? And then what we do is compute the one for z using the tables, <clears throat> and then go back to the quantile of x using this formula. All right? All right, and this is a property of the standard normal distribution, the fact 4.3. Okay, it says that, remember, phi is the CDF now, so the probability that is less than z is 1 minus the probability that is uh, less than z. Okay, um, let me see if we have the picture to that now. All right, this is exploits the fact that the normal distribution is symmetric with respect to mu. Well, is z, right? So the mean of z is 0, actually. All right, so 0 is right there. Um, let's put negative z and z symmetric, right? Okay, so this term right here is the area to the left, right? Why? Because this is the CDF, so it's the probability that z is less than or equal to negative z. So it's the area under the PDF curve, right? This is f of z. All right, <clears throat> and then you can see by symmetry that maybe my drawing is not very symmetric, but these two areas are the same. Because, again, f of s symmetric with respect to zero. So if these are the same, it means that um, this result. Okay, so this will be useful um, in the future. All right, so let's look at the central limit theorem for sums. Okay, um, so let's start with li general linear combinations. Oh, well, here I have a typo. This is the covariance matrix C. Apologies for that. All right, so these are the same formulas. I actually copy and pasted this from our last uh, discussion on these um, linear combinations, okay? So these are the same formulas, expected value and variance of the linear combination, right? Now, what's nice here is that we know from the central limit theorem that the distribution of u tends to the normal distribution, All right? So when you have linear combinations like these, it means that u will have the normal distribution with the expected value of u and the variance of u, which we already know how to calculate using the covariance matrix and all that. Okay, so if we click on this link, we're going to see a typical normal probability table, which gives you the areas here to the left of the z-score, right? So this would be z right here. Right, so this would be a typical table um, showing those values, right? So the first column is the value of z, and then the first row here gives you the decimals after the 9, for example, here, right? So if you wanted the probability that or phi of negative 3.92 you would look at the column and then in 0.02, right? So it's like you add this row to the first column, all right? So it gives you like the second uh, second decimal place, okay? And then in the body of the table, you're going to get the probabilities, the tabulated probabilities for the CDF, 
remember because we don't have analytical solution. So this is kind of this is a zoom in on that table, <clears throat> right? So here uh, in this example, z is equal to one point sixty four, right? One point six plus the zero point four. That's one point sixty four. And on the body of the table, you're going to find the value of 0.94, which means that this area is 0.94. So it's the CDF, right? Um, yeah, and remember that we're going to use the symbol phi now for these CDFs. OK, click on this link if you want to know how to compute this with your TI calculator. All right. Okay, so let's do an example. So if x has this distribution with uh, these values, let's calculate the probability, right? So, and we're going to use it using the table. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what we do. So the question is placed in terms of x, but we always do the z-score to begin with, right? So if it's this probability, so we're going to apply that transformation everywhere, right? So we're going to uh, subtract mu and then divide the whole thing by sigma, right? So we do 1.7 minus mu divided by sigma. We do the same thing with the x, but then that's the definition of z, so it's z. And then we do the same transformation to the 1.8, OK? So, uh, and of course, then we replace the values of mu and sigma, right, 1.7 and 0 0.1 squared, and you're going to get two values, um, so from here to here, right? And then you go to the table, uh, and that's going to be obviously, right, oops, that's supposed to be a phi, of the first term, let me just write it out. So 1.8 minus mu divided by sigma minus the CDF of the first point. Okay? So call this A and B, right? So this is the CDF of A, sorry, of B minus the CDF at A. Our typical formula. Okay. And these values you get from the table, right? Okay, so the value for A, right, is 0, because 1.7 minus 1.7 is 0. Um, so let's look up this number. <clears throat> so let me go to the table, and then I need to look for the number 0 here. So you scroll down, zeros right here. It's 0, 0.0, so it's the first column. So it's 0 0.5 is the um, is this term, 0 0.5, right? And then for this one, uh, so it's one point. No, actually, let me come. So for this term. Right, is 1.8 minus 1.7, that's 0.1, divided by 0.1, that should be 1. So let's compute the probability. So we're looking for the number 1 in the first column here. Um, I passed it, it's right here. And it's 1.0, so I'm going to take the first value. That's 0.8413. So this whole thing is 0.8413. All right, and that's your answer to this problem. So that's very typical. That's what we're going to do with normal random variables. Always go down to the normal distribution and then evaluate the table. <clears throat> Again, yeah, if you have the calculator, you can use the calculator too. All right, so here is the breakdown if um, it didn't make sense. OK, so this really good idea to uh, memorize these numbers because 
it allows you to tell at a glance whether a given distribution or given histogram that you might be looking at is normally distributed or not. Okay, so what we do here, again, we have the two axes, right? We have X and then Z at the bottom. Okay, so um, for X, so it's symmetric at mu, and then we're gonna see the probabilities within one standard deviation, so within negative sigma, two sigma, within two and three standard deviations, like that. All right, now in terms of the z-score, <clears throat> these are the corresponding values. So the number one for the z-score, really what it tells you, it's your one standard deviation away from the mean in terms of x. Similarly here, the number two means you're two standard deviations away, right? Because that the, all these numbers correspond to each other from x and z. All right, so the numbers I want you guys to kind of memorize are these three. Because what they're saying is, start with the 99.7. That, that number means that on a normal random variable, 99.7% of the realizations will be within three standard deviations from the mean. For example, if X is uh, rainfall in millimeters per day, let's say, all right? And if rainfall is normally distributed, it means that all the actual realizations of rainfall, so over the past year, you measure the rainfall every day. If you do a histogram of that, um, you're gonna find out that all the numbers are within three standard deviations away from the mean. Right, because 99.7 is, is just practically all, or 100%, right? And that's what defines, or this is the popular definitions of normal random variables, right? Is that all the realizations that you might observe should be within three standard deviations away from the mean. All right? Um, very good. Oh, and, and then if a realization doesn't fall within that range, we call it an outlier because it was supposed to be within that range, but it's not, so something's going on. All right, so similarly for 95%, it's if the variable is normally distributed, it means that 95% of its realizations will be within two standard deviations away, and similarly for 68.2, that would be within one standard deviations away. Okay, so um, this is these are kind of rule of thumb numbers, right? And they're so useful because most of things in nature are normally distributed. So you can tell at a glance using these rules whether they are or not. Very good. Um, yeah, please do that example. <clears throat> Um, let's do this one. All right, so X is normally distributed with those parameters. Calculate those probabilities. Uh, and this is standard approach, right? First, we standardize, right? Or we compute the Z-score. And then we're going to apply the same transformation everywhere as we did before, right? So nothing new here. For part B is... Yeah, the same probability, but uh, greater than 3. All right, so very simple, just to get you guys going, computing these probabilities. Please take a look at this one. All right, so let's take a look at this example now. Hopefully you did all the others that were kind of practice problems. Um, so this one, we're using the central limit theorem approximation. And again, this should be the covariance matrix, right? Okay, so here we have a network, like a road network, and then you've gone from point A to point B, right? And you have all the paths that you can make. All right, so these numbers give you the link number, so one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and for each link, we have 
the mean travel time, right? We have the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation, right? So, for example, link number five has the mean travel time of 10 minutes and the standard deviation of two minutes. All right, now they don't tell you that it's normally distributed, but we'll see what happens. All right, and then they give you the covariance matrix, right? Remember, this would be, for example, the variance of link number three. And this would be, did I say covariance? I meant variance of link three. And this is the covariance between link one and link five, which is the same as this one, right? Okay. Now, what happens is that we're going to compute the travel time on three routes. Actually, the three possible routes you can do. That's one, two, and three, right? So those are the three routes. And um, in part A, we want to know what is the fastest route from A to B. OK, so those are the three routes that I just um, drew. And then here are the links. All right. So we're going to define the variables T, capital T, as the travel times. <clears throat> right? So T1 is x2 plus x3. Why is it? Because T1 is this one, the first one up here. So it's link 2 plus link 3. Similarly, right, T3 is 1 plus 3 plus 4. Right, so th this one, right, 1 plus 4 plus 3, right? So all the routes in terms of the individual link travel times, all right? Now, since we see the plus sign, we see that these are linear combinations. Therefore, all the TIs will tend to, this, to the normal distribution. Um, Hold on, they told us that they were normal random variables. Well, they don't, right? So, okay. All right, and we actually don't need this, guys, right? Um, so if they were normal distributed, which is not said in this problem, so I'm going to change this. If they were, then we already know that the sum of normals, right, the linear combinations of normals is normal by definition. But if, if they're not, we can say by approximation, by using the central limit theorem, since we have a plus sign, we can approximate it by the normal distribution, such that all the travel times are normally distributed with expected value and variance given by um, the formulas for linear combinations, right? So um, we compute the expected value for all three routes, simply adding them, the individual ones. And similarly for the variances, right? Remember the, the variances of uh, linear combination formulas. OK, so make sure you get these. Um, remember the formula was a uh, c times a transpose c times a. <clears throat> these are these formulas. Okay, and then that's all you need. Because now you know that the travel times are all normally distributed. So here is a, a plot of all the t's, right? This is minutes, so it's, it's the time. And versus the probability, or the PDF. Okay, so at a glance you can see that route 2 is the fastest uh, in average. In average, because the mean, which is right by the tip here, is uh, 20 according to this. Let's make sure. Yeah, 20. Right? But also, you see the variances or the spread of the distribution. So here, um, here it's really up to you which one you prefer. So there's no right or wrong answers in this problem. And the reason is because. Look, um, you see that T1 is the one that sometimes gives you very low travel time, like eight minutes, right? But that doesn't happen very often, 
right? It only happens, you know, if you integrate and you calculate this area, that's the probability of having a travel time less than 10 minutes, right? So it may happen once, once a month or so, right? So it's very unpredictable. On some other days, you might have a very large travel time, right? 35 minutes or so. So there's this notion of risk, right? That, so if you take route one, yeah, some, time, some days you're, you're going to do really good compared to the others, but on some other ones, you're going to do really bad. So if you're more conservative, you might choose uh, the second route, right? You never get these low travel times, but also you're not, you're never going to get these very high travel times, right? So that's kind of the, the logic in, in this case. All right, here, uh, what is the probability that route one is faster than route two? Okay, so this this guy right here. All right, so here what we do is, so that's the question being asked, right? What is the probability? But then we subtract T2 because we know that the sum or any linear combination, right, in our case, um, we're using the central limit theorem approximation, so we can say that that linear combination, right, it's also normally distributed. So that's why we subtracted T2, such that we obtain a linear combination, right? And then we can call this difference y, and then the question is what's the probability of y less than zero, all right? And Here's how we compute the expected value invariance of y. It's really by using the same formula every time, right? So make sure you get these two. <clears throat> right here we have twice the covariance. Um, so see how we're using the fact that linear combinations of uh, random variables tend to be normally distributed, okay? Yeah, why is it negative sign? Let's see. If we can answer that. All right, um, let's finish this part C. What is the probability that route one is faster than route two? So it's the same, it's similar to this answer. Uh, the only thing is that now the covariance term um, has all these terms, right? And yeah, so it's parts B and C are pretty similar. All right, and with that, I'll see you in class.